D sub point is educational benefits. You'll research a new area of the topic that will teach you about the topic in a way that you wouldn't if you were just reading your Deontaf. Reading a plan can help you later in life. I've read, I've written several papers that were based entirely off of plans that I read in high school. If you debate a topic for two months or five months, if it's a TOC topic, you'll learn a ton about that particular plan area. You'll be able to apply it to the real world. You'll learn the skills of defending a plan, all of which are things that other forms of debate don't access nearly as well. The ESA point advantage to plan is as a surprise tactic. So we talked about that TOC final round. Neg had no idea what we, we were going to do. A lot of debaters don't prepare to debate every specific plan because it's really tough the way resolutions are worded. And even against those debaters who do a ton of research, you can usually find a plan that is so narrow that none of their, their generic counter plans or solvency blocks will apply. I actually broke a new plan on Ealing Day at TOC, and it was fairly effective, uh, and I read it three times. By the third time, it had become more known, so the surprise factor had worn off. But there was still pretty good benefit to reading something that no one had heard for the entire five, six months that we've been debating that topic. Disadvantages. Ace of point. Time trade-off. This used to be bigger when it was more expected to justify plans in the half, but if you're worried about negative theory arguments, you should have reasons plans are good. Not just in case they say plans bad, but in case they read these T arguments, they can be net benefits to a counterinter, or if they say a more specific theory argument, like can't run util with an ethical, or can't run an ethical framework with a plan. Right, a non-util ethical framework. So having plans good can help you in a lot of different theory debates. Spec, right? If they have a counter plan that's super vague and generic, your plan's good arguments could even be warrants for that theory in turn. It could be they could be warrants for why meta ethics are bad, why nibs are bad, anything that distracts from debating about the plan. There are a ton of different interps that you can use these arguments for, so I don't think that it's a bad investment in the app. It also, you are also at a disadvantage though in, uh, t in terms of time trade-off because you have to fulfill all the burdens of reading a plan. You have to read inherency evidence, something that you might not have to do if you're reading a more Kantian position. You have to read an impact card, you have to read solvency, you have to do all of these things because otherwise the negative can stand up and say you didn't do one of them and so your plan is bad, yeah. Also, um, I've always wondered, what's the difference between inherency and uniqueness? Like, what, what is, like, what does inherency prove? Well, uniqueness is a description of the status quo. Inherency does more than that, because you need to prove not just that the status quo is not your AF, but that the status quo is not going to solve your AF. Okay. So the traditional definition of inherency is a barrier to change. Okay. That there is some reason that the plan will not be adopted now. Traditionally, there are two variants to inherency. There's attitudinal inherency, which is that policymakers or the citizenry who have control over decisions do not want to do the plan. There's simply some attitude shift that needs to occur that will not occur in the status quo. And the second type uh, is structural. So there's some law or some authority problem or jurisdictional issue that needs to be repealed, revoked, refined to allow for the plan. Okay. I think it's probably a good idea to spend 40 seconds justifying your plan in the app. If you're pretty fast, maybe you can do it in 20 to 30 seconds, but having these theoretical justifications will really help you. The visa point disadvantage is not just that you lose time, but also you have to debate theory. If you're not so good or experienced at theory, this could be a little problematic. But there's a solution to this. Practice the plan theory debate a ton. Go to lectures specifically designed for debating theory and learning about plans. And if you focus narrowly on this one issue, you can master this particular theory debate without having to improve 
uh, your general theory skills, even though that's a good idea. But for the util monster, you only have to be good at a set number of theory debates. If you map them out, know all the arguments, you'll be in a good spot. C sub point is research burden. This is a kind of mundane disadvantage. Yeah, you have to research a lot. Oh well, you're the util monster. Research will become second nature to you. D sub point is judging. A lot of judges don't like plans. Even on the national circuit, there are judges who think that plans are bad. There are people who write articles that say plans are bad. They might not be appropriate for these more traditional judges concerned with the values of Lincoln Douglas and the history of Lincoln Douglas as a non policy event. One solution to this is to know your judges, to pref accordingly, but another or more creative one is to run plans in ways that they might like. So, for instance, you could read a impact about poverty, oppression, structural violence, etc., and read a very critical framework if that's what your judge likes. Or read a Rawlsian framework that cares about the least wall off. Read a deontic framework that cares about the specific harm that or duty about the specific harm that you're talking about. There are a lot of different ways to do it. Uh, and I think we've seen a couple with, for instance, the feminism apps on this topic that use a specific plan text. And then the ESA point to disadvantage is applicability. Some plans are just less applicable on certain topics. The first topic I ever debated was is morally permissible to kill one innocent person to save the lives of more innocent people? <laughs> Seems kind of odd if you were to read a plan that said we should kill this morally innocent person. Now we did have a plan that was about killing terrorists, or no, 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 sorry, killing civilians if it's needed to prevent terrorist plots. But, you know, there, there can't be that many examples. I heard joke cases like kill George Bush, you know, kind of ironic things like this. Uh, I do think that plans can be re read on any topic, but that there are only a few plans, or it's, it's more questionable on some topics. The recent ones certainly have been pretty good for plan debate. Agreed? Yes. Agreed. Except for the NSBA topic. What was that one? It was like inaction in the face yeah. of injustice makes you morally culpable. Why couldn't you say? Didn't say individuals, or just said makes one morally culpable. Like it says makes one. Right. I thought it was also the uh, specific campaign. Why couldn't you say that there's a specific injustice that inaction about is bad? So, for instance, inaction in the face of genocides, the U.S. should intervene when genocides occur, yeah, like dark like order. It doesn't provide any much ground. That's the point. Didn't you hear the A sub point yeah, on the advantages yeah. to being yeah, plan? Yeah, yeah, but then you get screwed on theory. Because then you're just going to end up in theory. That's like scales. Well, then read a more general plan. But what are more general plans on that topic? The Batman plan. Individuals should fight crime that or something about that. Plan. Yeah, vigilantism. <laughs> no, there was a vigilantism topic. You could defend that we expand citizen arrest laws to allow people to take action in the face of other types of injustice they see that aren't just major felonies. Or we should create a real-life Batman. Yeah, I like the idea of someone just doing it. Yeah. I know you do. So, yeah, of course, some plans are going to invite more topical debate than others. But also, you gain a lot of knowledge just by researching it. So, researching a plan about various genocides and what we're doing or not doing can be pretty good. All right, are there questions about to plan or not to plan? If it's unclear, I say plan. Plan. Like, how yeah. do you win that you're allowed to run a plan with a non-util framework? What do you recommend as a? Well, other consequentialist frameworks. So, you know, if your Rawlsian framework implies that we just care about protecting the least well off then that would be a good example. Uh, other critical frameworks that care about instance, <coughs> women's rights as an important thing. Uh, an environmental framework. So you could read, if you had a warming advantage, you could read that with a anthro-type framework and say, hey, we're killing off the environment. Are you worried? 
Is there any other worry there, or did you just want examples? Um, no, I, I just wanted like what the what the what my like counterintuitive standards would look like. Like, yes, I can because Kia. Oh, so against that particular theory debate. Actually, I'm going to talk about that at the end of the next section. Section four is plans good ammunition. So I talked about advantages to reading plans. Some of those can be turned into theory arguments, but let's go through quickly the arguments why I think plans are good. <coughs> I say quickly because I could talk about this for quite a long time. So this is some fodder for creating counterinterps. A sub point, clarity and clash. Plans create very clear advocacies that you don't have if you don't have plans. We don't know exactly what living wage means unless you define it. If you read your definition of living wage, fine, but we still don't know a whole lot of other things that could be clarified uh, by a plan. And if you read your definition of living wage and it's narrow enough, aren't you just defending a plan anyway? So I think that plans are an extension of defining words in the resolution, and they prevent this kind of uh, fuzziness about what the app's advocacy is. No one likes to be in these debates where the neg reads a dis ad and then the one error says, ha, didn't link to the app. I have a definition of living wage that proves it. It's silly. We need to have clear definitions from the outset so that both sides can engage. That promotes clash, promotes depth of education, not just in research, but in the debates themselves. B sub point, it prevents squirreliness. So the example I just described is not just an education problem because of a lack of clash, but also a fairness problem. Because people will intentionally define their app in vague ways to mess with the negative. I gave an example the other day about the juveniles should be treated as adults topic in the criminal justice system. This was several years ago. But there's a very common app where if people proved that harsh penalties for juveniles were bad, this person would shift in the 1AR to say, okay, fine, lenient penalties for both of them. We're still treating juveniles and adults the same, right? So they would completely shift what we thought the app was in the 1AR, say that it still proves the resolution true, and yet all of the negative ground that they read in the 1NC is gone. Does everyone understand that kind of example? So and this happens a lot. I mean, the neg reads a disad on this topic to <coughs> majoritarian rule in the Middle East. And then the 1AR stands up and says, ha, that didn't link. Democracy is not just majority rule, it's also Republicanism is also having a constitution, having a certain set of rights, that sort of thing. Having multiple branches of government, representation. Did any of this, did this happen in any of your practice debates? Because I saw it happen twice in practice debates that I judged. Yeah, it happened Exactly. Yeah. CISA point, it makes sense for the topics that are quasi-policy propositions. So in one of my posts, on PDT, I defend that most of these LD topics are would be categorized by argumentation theorists as not policy resolutions, and certainly not pure value resolutions, but rather a quasi-policy topic. That's something in between. On these sorts of topics, it makes a whole lot of sense to narrow them down so that we don't have endless debates about what it means to affirm the resolution, whether or not a certain interpretations are correct or not, you clearly stake out your ground in the AF, and it makes for a much more debatable proposition. I think that quasi-policy propositions are actually bad for debate, and that plans are a way to correct for that, because you can interpret it in a way that makes it a whole lot more debatable. Yeah? What if, like, in between resolutions? Every LD resolution that we have, for the most part. So... Just government ought to require employers pay a living wage. This is not a value question because it's not uh, so abstract. It's not, you know, and people should have means to live, right? There's some underlying value there that could be its own resolution. But it's not a specific policy. Why? Because it lacks a ton of context. It doesn't have a country, it doesn't have a mechanism, it doesn't have a, uh, all other aspects of the means that would make it easier. Different topic areas that you could choose from to develop plans would be a, a good addition. Okay, the was that the C sub point? Okay, so D sub point is that the tradition of plans makes them predictable. So 
you can say there's a norm of reading plans. I think this is a decent argument. If people have done it for a long time in debate, it probably means that it's justifiable, or at least it's something that you could predict, expect to see at a tournament. D sub point are uh, philosophy education reasons. So you can say applied ethics is really good, and very general resolutions don't lend themselves to great debates on applied ethics. If we don't know exactly what the res is about, we're really just arguing uh, about the framework debate in the abstract and not arguing as much about the specifics of a situation. There might be reasons why drone strikes do constitute self-defense in one context but not in another. But that applied ethics debate would never happen in a world where the resolution is just targeted killing good bad. The F sub point is that there are non-theoretical reasons why plans are good. So you can defend philosophical reasons like pragmatism or other, <coughs> other philosophical reasons why applied ethics as a moral method is a good starting point for ethics. So a lot of people think that we should go take a bottom-up approach and we should discuss applied ethics, make conclusions about those debates, and then use that to inform our normative ethics and our general principles, and then use that to inform our meta-ethical beliefs. If you were to justify such a model, you could say that the plans debate should be a starting point for even developing philosophy, philosophical theories, moral philosophy. To go a little more specific on pragmatism, uh, a lot of people read this Rorty card where he says pretty explicitly that philosophy should proceed through the use of concrete examples that we can apply, that we can, that we have a grasp of because they're real world cases rather than kind of outlandish thought experiments. Yeah. What's the title of the article? There's a bunch of Rorty articles. Uh, the one I'm thinking of is called Pragmatism, Relativism, and, <coughs> and Irrationalism. The Pragmatism, Relativism, and Irrationalism. But there are a lot of places to go for that. Okay, so that's your ammunition for counterinterps, but it might not always apply because they might read different plans bad arguments. So the second point under section four is to be wary of weird or different counterinterpretations. One of these is you can read a plan, but you must allow general links to disadvantages and NCs. Why is it strategic for the neg to read a theory argument like that? Yeah. Um, they get out of all your like plans, like none of your plans get arguments apply. Well, a lot of them don't apply. So for which ones don't? I thought, oh, Why is it good for the negative? Oh, because you don't have to directly engage with the plan? Oh, well, yeah. If the interp is accepted, then it's good for the negative. But why, theoretically, is it strategic? Like, uh, with the plan, you're, like, solving for, like, a shorter area. So, like, the DA could, like, be waived to have a bigger impact. Well, okay, those are reasons why it, the practice of getting general links is good for the negative. But the theory argument, as Catherine said, is good because it can can escape some of the disadvantages that a, a plans bad shell would have. So, for instance, if you say, reading plans and debate is good because we learn about real world issues. Well, this particular interp can say, sure, it was good that you read the plan, <coughs> but it's also good for the negative to have a strategy. This gets the best of both worlds because you can read the plan, we can hear about it, learn about it, and I can still read my general dissent. A lot of the plan's good ammunition that I provided can deal with this. So, for instance, clash and depth. Those things don't occur if the negative can just read their generics. B sub point, another common interpretation is that you can't read a plan with a non-utilitarian ethical theory. They'll say this is bad because you can cherry pick an ethic that meets the that the empirical conditions of your plan meet 
so well that it's undebatable. So for instance, if we had a poll that said that 100% of Americans want democracy promotion in Egypt, and we wrote a plan that said democracy promotion in Egypt with a polls framework, the negative wouldn't have any ground. Does that make sense? There's the negative would have very little ground to debate the contention level of the plan. Whereas a utilitarian framework, it seems that there is always more that can be said. There can be impact turns, there can be solvency turns, link turns, generic stuff can still apply. That's another flavor of plans bad that the util monster will want to be aware of. The CESA point is spec arguments that are specific to plans. So they'll say, if you have a plan, you have to specify this aspect of it because it's really good for all the reasons you said plan's good. So they'll co-opt your plan's good arguments to mean hyper-specification is good. Like you said depth, we should be even more deep in X way. So you know you define the living wage dollar amount, but you didn't define the industries it applies for. That leads to better clash, better depth, prevents squirreliness, all the things that I said. We need to develop spec-specific strategies to beat these arguments. I think there are good arguments for why, if you already have read a plan, that the specification meets some threshold that is probably sufficient to have a good, deep, and clashing debate. Okay, are there questions about plans good and the <coughs> other wonky counter -interpre interpretations? Yeah, I just have a question about plans in general. Mm -hmm. um, if you do a plan like this happens to be in a round, and the nag is seven minutes of generic solvency turns. Um, should you just like leverage your evidence and say it's specific to your plan? You should always do that, but in that case, it's probably not enough because the two and R is going to collapse down to a couple of those solvency turns and explain why they do apply it to the plan. And they'll say it's not new because now this is the first time you've made the argument that they don't apply, so they have a right to respond to that. I think that's a pretty uh, novice level plan strategy to just say, hey, your ev was generic, haha, it doesn't apply. You've got to go another step. And you can make better specificity arguments. So if, if it's seven minutes of turns, you're right, that's a lot to deal with. So one way you can do that is you can say, here are important aspects of the plan that your evidence doesn't take into account. So not just my evidence is more specific, but it's more specific in these three ways, and that makes a difference. So what is unique about this country's economy that will make living wage successful in a way that it wasn't successful in the cases that Newmark and Washer studied or whatever, right? Cool. So section five, the last section, is called out of round. How do you research and prepare for being a utility monster? We've already seen that there are a lot of theory debates that you can practice and that you can prep, but I want to focus on substantive research a little bit. So first is philosophy research, and we could do an entire lecture on this, but you need to be updating your util frameworks. Everyone has heard all of the cards that you currently have. All of them. And that means that they will have blocks, because util is the most prepped framework. So you need to be looking at philosophy blogs, blogs by consequentialist authors exist. You need to look at fill papers. You need to be looking in consequentialism categories. You need to find new articles. You need to look at journals that you have access to and see what's being published and find new stuff. Because if it's new in academia, if people are writing new papers, it's likely to be new in debate as well. And there's still papers being written every year about rule consequentialism in its various forms, and about act concept, consequentialism as well, but there's always new stuff, and this is really important. So before TOC my senior year, I held back several justifications for util that I hadn't read at all, because I knew that once disclosed or once read, filmed, that they would be prepped out. So that's where I picked up a new book. I said, well, let's see what pragmatism can do. Does it imply util in a strong way? Maybe not, but at least it was a very good framework trick that a lot of people weren't ready for. Same thing with the reductionism arguments. That 
I didn't see a whole lot when I was debating, and now have been become fairly common. But when they were first read, a lot of people didn't know what to do. You need to find the next layer of util justification. I believe in you. Second, researching your plan. There are two subpoints. A is part of your normal research strategy, and B is plan specific research strategies. When you research a plan, or when you're researching normally, authors will use examples. They, you'll read an article about democracy promotion, maybe you're using it for your imperialism answers, but it will use examples. And you want to write all those examples down in a big list. Every time you see an example of a mechanism, a historical example, a country where it's been implemented, you write those down. You also want to check out the footnotes, because a lot of times authors will discuss a general idea and they'll have specific instances in the footnotes. And even if you don't check those out right away, you have them in the back of your mind for later in the topic when you have a need for a new plan. You need to cut articles with plans and counter plans in mind. So when you see those things, you can go a step further, not just have the list, but also take a card from it and say, here's a solvency advocate I might use at some point. You should be checking Google News for plans, specific stuff. So if you were searching democracy promotion, what would you find? US democracy promotion. What's big right now? Does anyone know? Well, that's a problem. We need to be searching, because that stuff will give us really good inherency evidence, really good solvency evidence, really good harms when people are talking about it right now. And then, as also part of your normal research, when you bring, when you start a topic, you need to think about arguments from other topics and how they could be potential plans on this new topic. So for instance, on democracy promotion, I'd be thinking about other foreign policy topics, like the terrorist due process topic. I'd be thinking about uh, old sanctions topic. I would think about any topic that I know dealt with foreign policy, targeted killing, whatever. And I would see what can I do to make a counter plan of this ad or a plan out of that. On the drugs topic, I went back and looked at vaccine stuff. I looked at spread of HIV AIDS. If adolescent medical decisions is chosen for September, October, I would be looking back at the juveniles topic from a couple years ago, that juveniles ought to be treated as adults in the criminal justice system. <coughs> Now, the B sub point is plan specific research. News articles are key. I already talked about that. High quality evidence, often contemporary. So, I read a plan my senior year that talked about the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation providing malaria vaccines. Uh, and the week that I started researching it, I found a news article that said they had developed some new vaccine that was so much more effective than what they had been doing before. Uh, I remember John cut a plan on a drugs topic because he was inspired by an article he saw about North Korean military being funded by illegal drug trade. And so he found, saw that article in the news, sparked an idea, you need to be checking the news. Second place for plan specific research is think tanks, these big magazines and newspapers, stuff like Foreign Policy Mag, The Economist, Atlantic, often will do case studies and they'll often hold very specific advocacies. They're not just canvassing a problem, but they're coming up with solutions. Finally, sometimes you just get lucky. When I was a senior, one of my teammates was looking for some card that had very little to do with any particular plan, but he saw in the search results on like the 49th page of researching some other issue, this beautiful card that ended up being a solvency epic for a plan about women in Kashmir, which is a contested region uh, between India and, and Pakistan. And it was just a lucky find out of the blue, and that will happen, and you will get good plans out of it if you're paying attention. So conclusion. Some of you are thinking, Bob, why are you talking to me so much about util? I just want to run K's, Bob. Maybe sometimes I'll read Util, but no, monsters are scary.
being the Utah monster is like being another level of debater because it brings you from just being this kind of wishy-washy, I don't know what I am, debater who does all sorts of different things, to having an identity. People will be afraid of you when they debate you on Util because you are a monster. They'll be afraid to read plans bad against you. They'll be afraid to engage your plan. This will give you a strategic advantage of deterrence that prevents them from engaging in a bunch of different strategies. Yes, it's more work to read specific advocacies and do the research and check these news articles and this sort of thing, but no one said that becoming a Utah monster would be easy. Kathy, no one said that. So yes, you become predictable because you read Utah all, all the time, but I'll leave you with this thought. Just because the util monster is always under the bed, is it any less scary? <laughs> okay, drill time or break time? Break time. Okay, break time. Yeah, 20 minutes. Okay, then we'll do like two drills. Break time. Okay.